Hi, and welcome to On Point, a podcast by Oak Street Funding, where we bring research and data-backed insights to dig into the minds of industry leaders to learn how to stand out and navigate and break through this ever-changing industry. I'm your host, Bridget Height, and you can support this podcast by following us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on our website, or wherever you get your podcasts. We will be there hanging out and talking to industry leaders and ready to empower you to grow your business. Now let's get on point. Today, I am delighted to welcome Diana Cabrisas to the show. Diana is founder of Diana Cabrisas Consulting and a fractional chief evangelist to B2B wealth tech companies, including Wealthbox CRM and Wealth Tender's certified financial advisor reviews platform and find an advisor website. Over the years, she has helped wealth tech companies grow by amplifying the problem they solve for advisors through energizing presentations and content that educates financial advisors. So thank you so much for joining us today, Diana. Um, so we're just gonna jump right in. To start uh, by learning a little bit about you, you call yourself a fractional chief evangelist. Can you please tell me what that is? Yes, it is a loaded few words there. <laughs> Most <laughs> people are scratching their head when they hear the, the title. So we're going to break it down and we're actually going to start with the chief evangelist side. Okay. Um, so the term chief evangelist has been around for a really long time and most people quickly associate it with the religious world. And that is true. That's you know, There's a lot of origins in religion. But back in the 90s, we started to see technology companies bringing in the title for very similar reasons, right? An evangelist right. is your, your voice. It's your ambassador. It's someone who goes out in the market and really lights up the marketplace with your story and with your message. And okay. so we saw companies like Apple, Canva, right, all start to adopt the title more mm -hmm. formally. And now that is, you know, spread into financial services. The fractional piece, though, is, Bridget, uh, very much I am an outsourced sort of part-time chief evangelist for your okay. company. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, most people ask, well, why would you want someone part time? Well, a, tree, a chief evangelist with the caliber that most tech companies in our industry need or want, it's, you know, a six figure role easily, but not every technology company can afford a six figure hire. Or maybe the board doesn't approve or sure. there's other priorities. So you're still having the benefits and the big impact of a chief evangelist with the caliber, but at a fraction of the cost and a fraction of the time. I love, thank you. That was very clear and concise. I appreciate that. What gaps did you see in the industry that led you to start? You know, I really experienced the gaps myself. And I also was, you know, had other people bring attention to them to me. For example, I would go out and travel to conferences and I would speak on stage or, you know, I'd host some sort of event, maybe MC a session or be a moderator on a panel. Okay. And after the fact, I would have tech CEOs come up to me and say, you know, holy crap, how much do I need to pay you to do that for my company? That was really <laughs> good. And that right there was sort of the just the start for me yeah. of those aha moments that sure. this is needed. I think yeah. on the flip side of being part of technology companies, I've also seen when you've got a CMO, when you've got a head of enterprise or a VP of partnerships, they're they're very close to the customer or to the prospect, but they're also wearing the operational hat, right? They have to do their job. They have to run teams. They have to meet quota. OKRs, KPIs, and doing that while also trying to be a full-time evangelist for the company, it's really hard. So sure. I, I knew that there was a gap in a sense of capacity, demand, and people, but also from the offer itself, tech companies needed my help. I see. You saw the call. Okay. So what are some of the common marketing or growth strategies that RIAs can use to drive business growth? And how do you determine which strategy is the best fit for a particular practice? So I want to give you an uncommon growth strategy because it's, right. it's up and coming and, and it should be for very good reason. Then I want to talk about one common one. Okay. So starting with the uncommon marketing play or, or, or strategy, there are a lot of advisors who are tiptoeing around the idea of testimonial marketing. So using okay. online reviews in their marketing. marketing. 
<laughs> and you know, we know based on data, 50 to 75, maybe even 80% of a buyer's journey. So someone like you or I who are looking for an advisor, they're mm. going to do on their own terms. They're going to look at your website. They're going to look at Google. What kind of reviews do you have? The reality in this industry is that it was only two years ago that the SEC said, okay, you can start using testimonials in your marketing. The problem since then is I think there's a lot of, again, tiptoeing around compliance. Should I do this? How can I do it compliantly? But mm -hmm. there are ways to do it compliantly. This is something I often speak about and educate advisors on now as chief evangelist for Wealth Tender, which was the first SEC compliant testimonial platform for advisors. But what, what you're doing when you allow your clients to leave your reviews and you take those reviews and you put them on your website or you put them in a visible place like a profile or a landing page for people to see mm -hmm. is, again, you're meeting them where they are. You're meeting those needs. You're satisfying the emotional side of the buying journey. And essentially, you're letting your clients tell your story for you. So that's that's one very powerful way to move people along their journey, get them further down the funnel. And then I'll, I'll just share the second common way that advisors are growing that we're seeing is referrals. Oh, okay. So it's no secret, right? Most advisors will tell you their number one source of business growth is a referral. Sure. And that's great, right? We want to, we want our clients to love our service so much. They're telling their friends and they're telling their family. Uh -huh. And you know, that really just starts with good old like client service, right? Yep. You can have all the tactics and strategies in the world, but yep. as long as you're centered with your clients, you're storing their information as far as what makes them different, what what are their needs, what are their pain points, you know, what's going on this year for my clients, who's graduating, maybe there's someone in the house graduating. All of that should be documented somewhere so that you can later have those more personal conversations, send more personal gifts or communications host more personal events. And I think the, the advisors that are doing this the best, they they use their CRM the way it should be, not just a glorified Rolodex, but a wow. true central hub of information. Shout out to Wealthbox. Uh, I'm obviously on Team Wealthbox, and there's a lot of great um, features and, and just capabilities that the tool makes this so easy for advisors. Wow. And, and on that note of referrals, client events are such a great way to drive those. So for example, if you know your clients, you know, they love golf, right? You're hosting a golf event and you're telling them, bring a friend with you. So now it's not just my clients are there, but they're bringing someone. There's right. an educational topic we're going to cover. We're going to have some fun. We're going to network and get to know each other. Now you give that friend way more reason to want to continue exploring the potential of doing business with you. Um, so what technologies or services exist to help RIAs implement these growth strategies? So there's a few really what I would think to be like innovative technology in the space that help advisors grow their business, whether it's through testimonials, whether it's through referrals. Since I talked about those two specifically, I'll go back and repeat for testimonial marketing. I don't think there's a better platform out there than wealth tender. Okay. Most advisors would say, well, what about Google? What about Yelp? The problem with Google and Yelp is you can't actually solicit reviews from clients. Mm -hmm. Like okay. their, their platform doesn't actually allow for it. They have very strict rules and regulations. So I'm not saying okay. nix those platforms, but if you want to actually do it compliantly, wealth tender is a great tool. Um, when it comes to referrals and event marketing, I think White Glove does an amazing job with seminars and webinars for advisors. And then you have to think about, you know, what happens after the seminar? How am I nurturing these people and making sure I'm still sending them personalized content, right? They came to a tax webinar. I want to keep sending them tax content. I would say Snappy Kraken is one of the best email marketing tools out there for advisors. I obviously, uh, or I shouldn't say obviously, but I used to work at Snappy Kraken and I'm super passionate about what they do. I think the content is second to none in the space. So I'd say Wealth Tender, White Glove, Snappy Kraken. And then if you're looking to really have a super easy CRM where you can store this client data, you know, coordinate these events, everything seamlessly with a team, then Wealthbox is the way to go for your CRM. Great. Thanks for that. 
Um, so how do you identify and target potential new clients for an RIA, RIA practice? And what are some effective marketing techniques that for reaching them that you've found? There's, again, so many different answers to this question. But once you've established those unique selling points, once you know really deeply what they need, start to build on that. So your website's obviously your foundation. And that's where, again, you want to have who are you? What, what are you out to do? How are you different? And what in what way are you going to solve their problem? So always taking it back to them, right. not just you. And then from there, give them a pathway, right? So think about top of funnel marketing, middle of funnel marketing, and bottom of funnel marketing. Well, top of funnel is going to be those SEO, those ads. We're reaching out to people. We're targeting them where they are. We're, we're hitting them on the platforms that they're playing on. But once they go to your website, what, what's that middle of funnel experience? Can they opt in for a newsletter, for example? Is there some sort of helpful guy that's going to answer the three top questions they have around their finances as a business owner? And then from there, you continue to send quality content. So now we're sort of getting in from website to now, you know, middle of funnel content marketing. Where can they get on your blogs, on your articles? Do you have videos that you host on your website, which obviously videos are a really great way to connect with people digitally. But even further, once they're opted in, let's say you have a newsletter, you're some sort of special offer What's that experience for the men and how do you take them from I'm a subscriber on your email list to now I'm actually having a meeting with you because I want to meet. So from middle of funnel to bottom of funnel. Again, okay. email marketing is powerful. Having a great website, focusing on them, getting crystal clear and having that journey built in. So they have the information they need to make a decision even before they talk to you, which is just the reality of the way we buy today. So People have identified targets and have started marketing to them. So how do you assess and manage risk when pursuing business growth opportunities as an RIA? And what are some of the common risks associated with the growth? I think the number one question that you need to ask yourself is, can you handle the growth? Ah. So there are a lot of shiny opportunities out there. And when you come close to one, it, it becomes all the more exciting. This is it. This is the deal. This is going to move us from here to here from a revenue standpoint. This is going to fulfill some of our goals that we've had on acquisition or whatever the opportunity might be. But I think you really need to get real with yourself and ask yourself, can you handle the growth? Right. The risks that you might see if you're not properly doing your diligence, I think a lot of it comes back to due diligence is, for example, your technology, your people. Right. So right. from a technology standpoint, how how is taking on this opportunity going to change the infrastructure of our technology or will it make it more difficult or will it ease our lives? I think those are questions you need to ask. And then from a people standpoint. Do we have the right people in place to support this growth? If we don't today, what steps do we need to take to put the right people in place or hire or train? And even then, like how long is that going to take? And timing that with the opportunity itself. So there's, you know, a lot of different ways you could go about it. And I think, again, starting with the, the due diligence, making sure everything is aligned, that you've got the technology to support the growth. You've also got the people to support the growth. Um, I think those are these are two elements that should absolutely be considered when thinking about risks associated with taking on new growth opportunities. Okay, great. So how do you determine whether an M&A deal is the right strategic move for a financial advisory practice and what factors should be considered? Strategic alignment, going back to that first and foremost, is this going to move the needle for our business? Does this align with our goals, both short term and long term? Um, you know, our vision, our growth strategy overall, but thinking about synergy, people, culture, I think when you have such a great opportunity on the line, you, you, a lot of advisors and the people that are supporting them with these opportunities, M&A consultants, for example, they're, they're going to first and foremost focus on the financials, as you should. Let's do our diligence. Let's make sure the valuation is, is, is standing strong. It's supported. There's documents to support their claims. That's really mm -hmm. important. But an M&A has such a bigger impact on a business than just financials. There's a huge impact on culture. 
So if you, you know, aren't sure it's the right culture fit, or maybe there could be conflicts, right? You need to really think these through thoroughly. It's not just financial, it's also cultural. And then I'll go back to what I was saying a moment ago about technology. So when you're combining two firms, right, you're essentially combining your two tech stacks. And so how easy will that be? How difficult will that be? Um, Do our technologies even align? And then thinking about the, the people involved, not just the human capital in the business, but also our clients. Do we have any client overlap? How is this deal going to impact existing client relationships? Will it be positive? Can it be negative? Will it give us new um, you know, access to client segments or markets? This Again, this could be really positive for the, the firms or it could trend negatively. So I think right. just doing that research is really important. The last thing I'll say, Bridget, is the operational challenges. So... I've gone through a fair share of M&As in my career with the technology companies that I have been a part of. And I can tell you that the hardest part is always getting what we like to say, like the two trains on one track (laughs) operationally. (laughs) And sometimes they crash. Yeah, (laughs) I can imagine. (laughs) Yeah, and sometimes they, you know, it's really seamless, but it takes work. It takes putting the right people in place, having the right processes in place, doing the due, due diligence, and then getting you on an operational plan where you know one client can go through the entire experience and benefit from combined companies, but in a smooth way. So besides M&A, a lot of advisors are starting to discuss succession options, um, mm-hmm. either internal or external. What are some common challenges that arise when implementing a succession plan and how do you address them? So anecdotally, from the time that I spent at a company called Succession Link, where I talked to advisors all day long about their succession plan, about, you know, um, finding the right match, connecting with the right people Mm -hmm. and having that plan in place, it is really important. Uh, I learned that it's all, it's a very personal subject. So what I mean by that is I'm an advisor. I've spent my entire career building a practice. This is my, my, my pride and joy. This is my baby. And I have another advisor who is talking to me about succession planning. Almost always these advisors are going to over inflate the value of their business because it is such an emotional bond that they have with their businesses. Okay. Um, so I think out the gate, you know, that's that's something that everyone needs to keep in mind. This is a very personal conversation. Some of the challenges you might deal with right away is that emotional bond that you're essentially breaking in a bit of a way if you were to step in as a successor for a business. And so just understanding that it becomes personal and you're going to have to work around that. Um, of course, as you work around that, right, that's where you come in and you do the financial due diligence. You, you take into account the financial considerations, the valuation of the business. Again, is the, do the documents line up with that? Right. And does this plan align with his plan or her plan? So I've seen plenty of deals fall through of succession plans because from the onset of conversations, there were there were not clear goals. For example, I run a practice in California. You run a practice in New York. Well, if you're going to take over my firm, you're going to have to come over to California. Well, that wasn't something we talked about two years ago when we started these conversations. <laughs> now everyone is, you know, everything's falling apart. No one's happy. So again, just clear goals from the onset. Very important. Sure. That makes total sense. This has all been such great advice. Thank you so much, Diana. Um, so overall, transition can be hard. So how do you ensure that clients remain loyal to the practice after a transition of ownership? There's two things here I would share. Number one, proactive communication. Number two, relationship continuity. So I think there is never a thing, never such thing as over communicating when it comes to situations like these, right? When there's a transition happening or somebody's stepping away or there's somebody new being added in. 
you can never over communicate. Let's talk about the upcoming transition with our clients. Let's talk about the reasons why this is important to us and not just, you know, a broadcast email or video of some sort, but also one on one personalized communication with clients, whether it's happening during your meetings, you're picking up the phone, you're calling your client and you're telling them this is what is happening. I think that is super important. Yeah. Now, on the, the flip side of the, the communication, actually, it all ties in together, is the relationship continuity. So, for example, if Joe meets with Sally and Sally heads up our you know client services team and Joe is used to meeting with Sally, I would do everything in my power to keep that, that set up, right? That if I sense. am giving my firm away, right, part of the negotiations are going to be I need my key players to maintain their positions, and I need them to continue on managing and nurturing the relationships they do. So I think, you know, there you can't um, underestimate the power of the relationship your clients have already built with members of your team. And so keeping them in place as much as you can, I think, will go a long, long way. So again, proactive communication, let them know why you're doing this, how it's going to continue to benefit them, why it might even be better for them in the long term. And then with your people, making sure you don't change too much too soon. Let these bonds maintain themselves. Let your clients still get the same awesome experience with the same people. Love it. That all makes total sense. Thanks, Diana. Hey, before we end the show, we like to ask a more personal question. So uh, sort of a fun question. Besides your job, what are you passionate about? Yeah, I like that you asked this question. I love that we're ending on a personal note. Um, I love to travel. And (laughs) traveling to me is just, it's such an important part. Like it's a need that I have to maintain my sanity. I need to be (laughs) able to just like spread my wings and fly whenever I want. This is partly why I am so passionate about remote work. If I want to go work from another state or city or country, I can do that. But um, yeah, I I think with travel, you know, I started back in 2015. I I took off. I sold all my stuff. I went and traveled. I was supposed to go to Europe for three months. I ended up staying for two years. And that was that was the start of, I think, the travel bug. Um, There's been 18 countries I've visited since then. And I'm. I'm not done. So, That's so. <laughs> so are you more of a um, go and relax and chill kind of traveler or are you a I want to go see everything and live like a local kind of traveler? I think when I started out, I was the latter. I wanted to go see everything. I would go all day long with my backpack, some water, some snacks, and you wouldn't see me until the nighttime. <laughs> As I've gotten older and there's more responsibilities on my plate just from my career, right. I, I've gotten a little more tired. And I'm I'm now in the place where I'm like, yes, I want to do those things, but if it's a three-day trip, I'm going to spend two of those days relaxing. Relax. <laughs> just, get, just relax. You're a busy lady. You need to relax. <laughs> exactly. Yep. <laughs> oh, this has been so nice. Thank you, Diana. It's been lovely talking to you. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks for having me. This has been wonderful. I hope it's been helpful for the advisors that have tuned in on the show and that we get to do this again sometime. I'd love that. Thanks again. Thank you all for listening to On Point, a podcast by Oak Street Funding, where we bring research and data-backed insights to dig into the minds of industry leaders and to learn how to stand out and navigate and break through this ever-changing industry. I am Bridget Height. Tune in next time wherever you listen to podcasts as we get On Point. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review.